Okay, first, I have been extraordinarily impressed with the diversity of perspectives that you've heard. Um, and I want to th thank uh, all of it. Let's thank the uh, speakers uh, who put on a tre tremendous amount of uh, food on our plates for thinking about the theory of mind. Now, that having been said, I want to start with uh, Ralph's, Adolf's uh, uh, initial charge, which is um, the theory of mind is, 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 is really uh, encompasses a lot of different tests, uh, developmental sequences as things unfold. And uh, should we expect that to be special? in terms of different from other cognitive capacities. And I, I reminded about another cognitive capacity, which is actually older in terms of study in psychology and in neuroscience, and that's attention. So if you look at the attentional literature, you'll find that it is every bit as messy as a theory of mind literature. That is to say, it's used in a dozen different contexts to mean different things. And in fact, uh, it has given rise to arguments in psychology. Cognitive psychologists, for example, debated, is attention an early event in the sensory processing stream, or is it a late event? And you can do experiments to show one or the other. And of course, the answer is that it's probably very much distributed. And depending on what experiment you do, you're going to get a different answer. Uh, and how has this been resolved? Well, it's been resolved in part by dissecting out all these different uh, tasks to see what they have in common, what makes them different. So there's, there's attention A, and there's attention B, and attention C. And each one of these can be studied both uh, from a behavioral perspective, but also by recording from the uh, different parts of the brain in monkeys from single neurons, and also in humans using brain imaging. And it just takes a lot of thought and effort and careful analysis to sort that out. And I have no reason to believe that the same thing won't happen in this field. I'd like to pick up on another really interesting um, comment that Jason Mitchell said at the end of his talk, which was, isn't it interesting that the same brain areas that pop up over and over again in people who are studying uh, theory of mind in humans, uh, this is medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior parietal cortex, the, the temporal parietal junction, also have shown up in brain imaging studies when you ask a person just to sit there and don't do anything. Now that's kind of peculiar. I mean, is, is that just an accident? So let me give you the history here, which is really fascinating. So ever since brain imaging first came on the scene, this was uh, quite a while ago, back in the 60s, initially with positron emission tomography and later with fMRI and, and uh, EEG recordings, um, the way that uh, experiments were done was to compare a particular brain activity pattern when you're doing a task. Uh, and you subtract from that the brain activity pattern when you're not doing anything. It's an A-B comparison, right? So Mark Rakel, about 20 years ago, asked the following question. Well, what are we subtracting? You know, th th we're trying to look at a difference, but you know, maybe, th maybe the thing that we're subtracting might be of interest. And of course, that uh, it would turn out to be uh, this particular pattern of areas that we, he called the default state by default. Uh, but now it's turned out to be fractionated into a bunch of different resting states. Uh, and, and, and the way he w was able to show this is not just because they are active, but it turns out they're actually changing. When the person's in the scanner, it's not like it's fixed. It's, it's constantly going up and down. But these, the activity in these different areas is going up and down together, which is suggesting that they're linked, and indeed they turn out to be connected anatomically. So they are part of a system. What kind of a system is it? Well, here's the other uh, penny dropping. When you are processing sensory information and responding in a reflex manner, the activity pattern in this resting state goes way down, and activity goes up in the sensory motor areas. When you're not doing a sensory motor task, the activity in those areas goes down, and the resting activity goes up. They, they, are, they're opposite, they go opposite each other. Every paper that's ever been published on monkeys 
have if another, many other species too, has recorded when the monkey was actually doing a task in which it was required to have a, a response to a sensory stimulus. Now there are memory tasks and you can make it arbitrarily complex, but it turns out that I don't think anybody has ever recorded from a monkey in a resting state. And even if they did, how would they know how to interpret the recording? What are you gonna relate it to? There's no behavioral output going on, right? This is a challenge. How, this is a system that apparently is very important for the theory of mind, but how do you get access to it? Well, here's an opportunity. Every day, there are humans, and there are millions of humans who have epilepsy, and who go in uh, and are drug resistant, so you can't just stop it with a drug. About 30% of all of the uh, patients with epilepsy need to have surgery. And one of the things that needs to be done is to record broadly throughout the cortex, both on the surface and in depth, to isolate the focus of the seizure so that you can take it out and prevent them from starting. It's a little more complicated than that because it's actually a, a generalized seizure in many cases, in which case you have to also be sure you don't take out the language areas or the motor areas that are important for movement. But here's what happens. They plant these electrodes and the, 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 often for several weeks while the patient is in bed or walking around and doing things, what a fantastic opportunity to, to try to understand what's happening in these different parts of the human brain. And indeed, there are a few labs. I'm collaborating with Sid Cash at MGH. Brian Litt at Penn is doing similar experiments. Uh, Ishtak Fried at UCLA, working directly with neuroscientists to do experiments. And it turns out patients, they're bored, they're afraid, they really uh, appreciate the fact that they're uh, contributing to a scientific question. Uh, my colleague Christoph Koch, for example, collaborated with Ishtak Fried, recording from the visual part of the brain, the inferotemporal cortex and the hippocampus, and here's a, a nature paper that was published a few years ago. He found a neuron that re respond vigorously to pictures of Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> and not to uh, other actresses. Or Brad Pitt, who was, uh, she was dating at the time. Um, now interestingly, uh, and, and I think that he also found a Halle Berry neuron <laughs> in another patient. But it would also respond to her name written down. So that suggests that this is a, a semantic uh, response. In, in any case, you know, I'm, I'm, this is an anecdote, but the fact is that uh, it should be possible to design experiments to test subjects in these areas where we know theory of mind uh, activity patterns have been found and, and, and really get to the bottom of it in the same way we have gotten to the bottom of attention. I think it's a, a doable. Uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of barriers uh, in terms of working in the operating room. It's a very uh, complicated team that's working there, and their goal is, is speed, trying to get uh, something, a job done as quickly as possible and as well as possible. But it, it's something, it's an opportunity that I think if we can uh, make it easier, uh, make it uh, both for the neurosurgeon as well as for the scientist, uh, during those two weeks when the patient really isn't in the operating room to make it easier to be able to re both record and, and test, uh, who knows what we'll be able to discover about the theory of mind. So let me end by, uh, first of all, thanking our sponsors, the Maders Foundation and the uh, Atkinson Foundation for uh, supporting this uh, symposium. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, and uh, we have questions coming up uh, for the speakers.